What's happening, coders? We're here taking a look at a fun little concept called authentication and authorization. This little series is meant to go over the lectures, I suppose you could call them, of the concepts we're going to be encountering and working with, because I'm more concerned about you, the student, understanding why and how we're doing it and not necessarily memorizing the nitty gritty code that gets us there. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go. There's going to be a couple of videos in this series that might be a little bit redundant. Like if you already have a database that you already have a schema connected on and like uh, created and connected to a project, like you already have that server DB folder that has the index file inside of it that has our MySQL create pool, the const query utility function that we wrote in previous web series and um, and, and course and uh, topics in this course, uh, talking about .env like we did back in third-party APIs. Like some of these videos will be redundant, so you, there are a couple I'm gonna try and keep short and modular. So I'll preface them with, hey, your project may already have this, so feel free to skip it. But if you want to rehash the fundamentals or just le like listen to how I coded out, by all means, stick with them, and I'll try and keep them shorter and more skippable. And then when I get to the point where my boilerplate setup has like you know a a dedicated routes folder, uh, a database of some kind that we're going to be checking our login attempts with, all the .env stuff connected so we don't push anything secret to GitHub if we don't need to. Once those little setup videos are out of the way, we'll get into the meat and potatoes of this particular lecture series. But here are some of the basics of what we're going to be going over before I head into those walkthroughs of those small modular, some skippable, most not videos. So authentication and authorization. Now, technically, there is a difference in those terms that, you know, as with all things, I just learned the hard way over time, where authentication is confirming who users say they are, and then authorization is giving those users permission to access a resource. Those are the two, like, technical definitions of what we're looking at here, but, you know, most people might just use the term auth for everything, and that way they don't have to worry about knowing the difference in those terms. It'd be one of those things that I'd say memorize and regurgitate definitions like that for interview type style questions. If some interviewer decides to ask you if you know the difference between those two, you can just tell them one is for confirming who they are, other one is giving permission to access, stuff like that. In this case, whenever I use the term auth, I'm probably referring to one of these things. We can think of authentication as our login attempt. We're going to confirm that the user says who they say they are, and we will then issue some kind of token that in the future will authorize them to make protected resource requests, right? So like I mentioned in my intro, we're not going to stress about the itty bitty, the nitty itty bitty, I mean, it's actually not that much code, but the nitty gritty code that gets us to our end goal here of, in this series, having a an Express server that has implemented some kind of auth on it. We have a protected endpoint, doesn't matter what it is. We have the ability to log in and get a token that we can then present to that protected endpoint to retrieve that protected information. That is the sole goal of this little series, right? We're not gonna be building anything big and great. It's gonna be very, very simple, all right? So the big picture here, again, is understanding the workflow behind this and not everything that gets us there because it could change from project to project. And I recommend that you try different things on different projects. Um, and wherever you go to your job, you're probably not going to be some junior level security developer where you're going to just kind of guess around to provide security for your apps. And I want to make sure that y'all know how it works. So if you do get some kind of intern or junior position of learning about, uh, encrypt, like data encryption and security and things like that, you have a good foundation from which to build up upon, right? So this could be in its entirely its own like 60 to 100 hour course if you wanted to be incredibly in depth. But for the full stack bootcamp in this video series, we're going to keep it again down to the fundamentals and let's get going. So something that I wish I had as a student is not just a bunch of lecture videos that talk about you know, all these concepts and their technical definitions and what they're used for, but I would love to have seen as a student some kind of diagram of what our ultimate goal is going to be. Notice there are two little bits of the diagram right down here, which is, um, one is the login request and the other is the protected endpoint request. So we can think of this as authentication and this one down here as the authorization workflow. Notice they're gonna be very, very similar. 
So let's kind of break them down. What I mean by clients, this could be our React website. It could be a React native app on somebody's phone we code. Maybe this is just a HTML and CSS and jQuery project we're putting together. Honestly, it doesn't matter. For now, we're gonna pretend it's just somebody on their laptop, on their personal computer, on their mobile phone, whatever it may be, running our app. And in our case, it will be a React app. So I'll kind of refer to it that from there. The other side is our, this little server, picture I managed to find on draw.io, which is where I made this, if y'all wanna check that out for making your own little diagrams or adding to mine if you like. Um, this is a server, it represents our express server and we're gonna presume it's connected to our MySQL database, but it doesn't have to be. It could be using uh, Mongo, MongoDB, a NoSQL server or something like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be with MySQL, which is why I wanted to keep it kind of agnostic. But we can assume that when I talk about the server, in our boilerplate, our course, and this web series, we're gonna be assuming it's attached to a MySQL server and database, right? So here's how it goes. You typically will end up on a login page, and from that login page, you will fill out inputs with either an email or username, doesn't really matter, and a password of some kind, right? And when that request happens, more than likely we're gonna package it as a fetch post request to some kind of server endpoint. Maybe it's uh, off dash or off slash login. It doesn't matter what the path is because we can code that ourselves, but we're gonna package that information of the email and password more than likely as a JSON body, as rec.body.email, rec.body.password, and we send those to our server. Some kind of express route, it could be forward slash API, forward slash profile, or forward slash API, forward slash login, or forward slash off, forward slash login. Again, the path doesn't matter, you can make it up. Just make something up that seems intuitive. Again, I like off login personally. I, I write this here with maybe with passport local because I might actually jump back up to this diagram when we start talking about passport, but we're gonna sideline that for now. Purpose here is, does this email correspond to something in our database? So we're gonna have a query that says, try and find this email and find that row. Because if that email doesn't exist, then there's no point in even checking the password because this person can't log in. They have to go register. So maybe we send an error that says email not registered, right? As our response if that workflow happens. Let's say our express route says, okay, I found the email. Now let's see what password they're using against the password in the server. So what password are they trying to log in with? Let's compare that to what's in the database. They're the same, email is found, passwords check out, guess what? They are logged in. So we're gonna create some kind of thing, some kind of certificate, token is the keyword we're gonna be using a lot, some kind of token called the JWT or JSON web token. We're gonna make something that says, okay, you're legit, this is an email that is real in our database, the password you're logging in with is the password you registered with originally. That means this thing, this token is gonna represent that, hey, you're cool, you've logged in now, so do what you want with it. And so that's where we're gonna send, not an error, but our JSON web token, or the token that represents someone has indeed correctly logged in. And then when that happens, we're gonna store that token somewhere. It could be in a variable, it could be in local storage, inside of session storage, or a cookie. Some kind of built-in mechanism that can then take that token and hold on to it for a period of time. And that's it. That's all the login request is gonna ultimately end up doing, right? Next, what do we do with the token now that we have it stored? The purpose would be the following. Let's say they head from some home page to their profile page. How do we know that A, we need to populate that profile page with this user's information, and how do we know they claim to be who they are, right? What if I just went to, what if I try to go to somebody else's profile page? Should that be allowed to happen? Probably not. The only profile page that should be able, that I should be able to see is my own and not somebody else's. And that's where, the token comes back into play. So let's say I navigate to a profile page. How does it know what to do? Well, here's an idea. It might try and get that token from wherever we stored it, the variable, local storage, session storage, cookies. It just takes that token and says, okay, now what? Well, I'm gonna attach it as this particular syntax here. I don't think I can zoom in on this, so sorry about that, but it says, it's curly braces because it's inside of an object, and it says authorization bearer, capital B bearer, and the word token. We're gonna talk a little bit more about bearer token coming up here, but that's just a very 
standard and common way to do token-based authentication and authorization. So that's what we're going to be using here in this course. And again, I have a little section about it below this uh, diagram. Well, we're going to attach that token onto our request somehow. Hey, I'm making a get request to the profile route, API profile. Also, here's a token I'm attaching with it and shipping off the request. Our server, our express route, like API profile, maybe with Passport JWT. Again, we'll talk more about that later. It was going to receive that request and go, yo, hold up, hold up, hold up. This profile stuff is secure and protected. Ain't nobody can come in here and just make whatever request they want or oh, nearly will it. So what it has to do is look at that request and say, oh, hold on though. Here's an authorization key on this request. What does it say? Bearer? Oh, it bears a token on it. So let me let me make sure it says authorization and the word bearer. Okay, these two exist. Let's grab this token now and almost like a, a scroll, we're gonna examine it and say, well, the wax seal isn't broken. That's that's my wax seal, that makes sense to me. Yeah, okay, I made this, I, I definitely made this. It hasn't been cracked open. Nobody's messed with it. It seems to be fine and it's not expired. Maybe we have some kind of magical parchment on this scroll that will turn to dust after 15 days if no one's touched it, right? Uh, basically, we're just validating, verifying. We're making sure that A, we found the token with the specific authorization bear set up. And that token we get is something that we made and not some Joe Schmo created for whatever he wanted, like just mashed his face across the keyboard and said, here's my token. We have to make sure that we made it somehow. And there's some algorithms and tricks we're gonna use to do that. And thankfully they're all coded for us. Don't worry, you don't have to do a bunch of algorithm and math and stuff like that. We just have to know conceptually what we're doing, but we don't actually have to code a lot of it ourselves, thankfully. But again, we have to make sure that token is legit. It belongs to somebody we know and that we made the token and we have a way of validating that information, right? That's all we really care about, okay? And if all that checks out, then allow the request to do what it set out to do. This token claims it belongs to me, Luke, user ID one. Let's go look up user ID one's profile in SQL, get that select statement, return my profile information, package it up, and send it as a response. And then that way, that response, based on my token, populates only my profile page and it's protected to make sure that nobody else can get that view, that information, because it's protected by our server. That's cool. If there is no token, we would send an error instead, right? If that token doesn't validate or hey, something's like this, the wax seal on this token is broken. I can't trust it. So error, send back an error saying something's wrong with the token. I don't trust this thing. Uh, maybe the token, again, expired. Maybe if it had an expiration date, the error says, the token's expired. You're gonna have to log in again to get a new token. And that's what happens sometimes when you're out there and you've logged into a website, you don't visit it for about a month and come back and it makes you log in again. You're like, oh, I can't remember my login credentials. Probably what ended up happening is they have a, some kind of token or session that lasts a certain amount of time and then the whole thing goes kaput when that timer expires. So that's the basic idea, the basic premise of what we're doing here, yeah? So continuing on down, we have more concepts to discuss. But before I can, before I actually go and talk about those concepts, let's kind of focus on this diagram and kind of break it down into an analogy that I, a student taught me from Discord. They started using this analogy and I'm like, that thing is absolutely brilliant. So let's, let's go through this and maybe I'll cut the video here. We're gonna try and make sure this is not an hour and a half extravaganza of just talking about lecture and authentication theory and concepts without actually coding or talking about anything. I'm sure a lot of y'all's eyes will glaze over the more and more I talk about these theories and concepts without actually coding anything alongside them. So I will try and cut it off after this, but imagine this. Imagine us, our application is like a hotel, right? You can enter a hotel lobby without checking into that hotel first. If there is a bar or restaurant, that may be public access. Like I could come off the street with no intention to register and check in and stay at that hotel, but eat at the attached restaurant. That could be like a public endpoint. Anybody going to the homepage of my Instagram clone app can see pictures, but they can't comment and like and follow and they can't post their own pictures unless they're logged in. So you could have like your own hotel lobby on your app where you have public endpoints. Anybody can come in and make these requests. See all the homepage posts, read the details of a blog, stuff like that. But if you want protected interactivity, you're gonna have to go to the front desk of that hotel 
and register and check in as a person that's gonna be at that hotel, which is what ends up happening down here, right? Well, the check-in process is here, and that token is gonna represent your hotel room card, the card that allows you to enter your room, or maybe if it's a fancy hotel, certain floors that maybe where the pool is or where the gym is, only registered guests can access those floors and they're no longer public. So the hotel key card gets you access to the gym, to the pool, and then in the rooms, it only gives you access to your room and not everyone's rooms, right? And on top of that, do we even have to go to our room right away when we are issued that, that key card or the token is what we're gonna be kind of referring to it as? No, we could put that token in our wallets, in our pockets, in our purses, and simply walk back out the door and go eat dinner, go catch a movie or a show if we're vacationing, go to the beach, and then whenever we get back from whatever we were doing, we can then just go to our room without having to go back to the front desk. We simply go find our room, use our key to open it up, and we're good to go. And that's exactly what we're gonna be taking the approach on here in this authentication series. We're gonna be essentially building a front desk, a public space for our application, a front desk where they can register and log in and get these keys, these, these hotel room key cards, and then we don't care what the users do with them. They can wander off, they can go to the room right away, doesn't matter. And that's actually a concept called stateless workflows or stateless authentication, right? Says guy that, oh, I'm gonna cut it off after this diagram. Let's just go through this and then we'll go through the more nitty gritty stuff Yeah, down here after, but okay. Stateful versus stateless. We're actually gonna be only focusing on coding a stateless style authentication workflow on our applications rather than stateful. So why would I include this here? Again, I want y'all having a strong foundation to learn how to add different kinds of workflows to your applications or whatever your company. If like your first job is a big enterprise company, you know, you're gonna have to learn how that workflow for them works compared to one that you've implemented yourself. So that's why I wanna have y'all equipped with as much knowledge as possible rather than just saying, here's how to do it, K okay, bye, which is kind of what the course does now. And there is some benefit in keeping it simple like that, but I'd rather have y'all armed with knowledge. Knowledge. <laughs> um, so we talked about that hotel key card analogy, and I call that a stateless workflow. Stateless means that once they get the key card, we don't care what they do and where they go. The only time we're gonna care about the key card is when they go to their room, they flash it on the doorknob, they stick it in the, the slot, and if it validates, they're authorized to go into their room, right? We don't care what they do with the key card outside of that. The key card is also coded to expire itself and however long your stay at the hotel is, meaning it kind of manages itself and that's a stateless workflow. So what would stateful be? That'd be like going to a, I knew not to double click on it yet, I did anyway. Sorry about that. I went to the, the raw readme mark down there, which I tend to do in these webinars, these, uh, these video series when I accidentally double click stuff. So what is a stateful workflow? That'd be like going to a hotel, checking into the front desk, and they give you a key or a card with a string attached to it. Meaning, they're gonna care if we try to leave the hotel, they're gonna yank that string back, say, nah, dog, you can't, you're, not, you're not getting this key with you. We own the key, that's our key. You can't go anywhere other than our hotel with this key. All right, I'll see you in an hour. You come back, go back to the desk again, and you can't just go to your room when you come back. You have to go back to the desk, get the key again with a tether or a string or a rope on it or something, drag it all the way up to your room, get into your room, and then when you're in your room, for example, you can keep the key in there, but there's still gonna be this awkward rope or string headed back to the first, the front desk where you're tethered to. Kind of awkward, right? Well, there are some pros to that. And so think of the key, like that key with a tether on it as something like you would store what's called typically a session. Some kind of session ID represents that key that says, hey, as long as you're on my website, here's a key with a tether on it. So when you need to do protected stuff, I know you're good to go because you have this tethered key of information tied to yourself. But once you leave, we're gonna cut that cord or yank it back and you don't have it anymore. And there are some pros to that, even though that sounds ridiculous with the hotel analogy. For an application, that's actually some sometimes a pretty secure and safe idea to do. I'm not, I wasn't making fun of the a key tied to a rope to necessarily make fun of it or call it bad, but just one possible way of doing it. So 
wh how is that useful, right? Well, if we're doing a session by session basis, it's really easy to revoke and ban them, meaning I can just yank that cord back or cut the cord when I decide, you know what, I don't like you at my hotel, so you can't stay here anymore. Cut the cord and they can't do anything else in the hotel because if they don't have a cord, that if they don't have a, a securely fashioned rope, they're gone. They just get banned and escorted out of the hotel right away. No problem. If we don't want to, if we don't want them entering a room, we simply yank the cord back. They no longer have a key. That's easy to do, all right? And that way, it's always easy to stay in sync. Meaning, if they did something bad after getting in our hotel, we can go, oh, whoa, 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 pull that key back, pull that key back, without any kind of issue. But there are some cons to this approach of stateful, and sometimes this is called sessions, by the way. So if you ever see like, oh, we're gonna learn how to do authentication using sessions and session storage and session IDs, they're using a stateful process. Cons to that, though, are increased server load and overhead. We're gonna have to have some logic of how to yank the key back, cut it off, uh, because every single time they try and use the key, we're gonna have to make sure that the the rope is indeed theirs, the rope belongs to them, The it's not cut, it's not yanked back, it exists in the database, everything checks out, good, good, good. So that's gonna be some database queries. And the more queries you make, that's more and more and more resources being eaten up by your server. So imagine that with a million concurrent users. Your front desk is gonna have to have a million pieces of rope hanging off of it with all these people logged into our application and goofing off on it. That's hard to scale, right? At least vertically, in the sense that when we have more and more and more people, it's hard to do. But it's easy to scale horizontally because if like we have to change or add properties of data, that's easy to do because we know exactly how many ropes are out right there, how many people are tethered to our desk, and we can just tell everyone, hey, everyone, we're changing everything right now that has a, uh, a rope tied to them, so here's what's happening. That's easy to do. Um, harder to scale because in the real world, you might have several different servers deployed maybe around the US on a huge enterprise application. You're not gonna have all of your server information in the corner of your room there that millions of people are accessing at the same time. You might have clusters around the US for speed purposes or around the world for that matter. And how are you supposed to know if someone logged into the desk in my house that I have a key for compared to a desk somewhere maybe in Poland? Who knows, right? So it's hard to scale that kind of stuff there. And because we're handling it all ourselves with our own little rope system, <laughs> this might have been my analogy so far, it's difficult to integrate third-party apps to use that system. So if we had something like Google, you can use Google to log in to other people's sites. Like people build games and uh, you know to-do list apps. And they, they have web apps out there that allow you to log in with your Google credentials. So more than likely, they're not using this stateful kind of login information because that'd be really hard to do. I would then have to have some kind of special additional pulley tethering system on a third party app sounds like a nightmare, right? And so that's what Stateful does. It does have pros and cons, just like Stateless. Stateless is that original example with the hotel key card. We don't tether it to the desk, we just let them go off with it and that's it. So it has a low server load because we don't have to worry about how many key cards we've issued and what people are doing with them. We only care when they bring them back to us and say, I wanna get in my room now, then we're gonna care about what we're doing. So it has a low server load because we're not running constant queries all the time. That's easy to scale. Whether we assign 10 key cards or a million, it's easy for us to do and it's quick and it's simple, which means that if we make key cards, third-party apps can also ask us for those key cards and say, hey, this key card that you've logged in with is your same login back over there. And that third-party app's like, oh, cool, that's awesome. So I can, use, I can use Luke's awesome project as my login here? That's really neat. And that's what you can do with like Google and Twitter logins on other applications, pretty cool. But trade-offs, and that's gonna be my favorite term that I think I forget to mention. I'm surprised I didn't mention, I'm highly surprised I didn't write the word trade-off in my original dissertation up there, my abstract, but um, trade-offs is a big thing I talk about on server-side development, and it's coding in general, where if you make a decision, you're gonna have to pay for that decision in one way or another, meaning the cons of stateless authentication. Well, if I have a million key cards out there and they're not in any way tethered to my front desk at all, and I don't have some system that identifies them somehow, how am I gonna revoke one key card out of that pool? Kind of hard to do that. I'd have to go track that person down 
reach into their pockets and get the card back out, which may not be easy to do. So it's going to be more technically complex to do some of the pros that state full allow us to do. Meaning if we're going to add new properties to the key card starting now, I'm saying all key cards are blue. Well, I have a hundred thousand red key cards out there and I want to use blue ones now. So how do I go collect all the red ones first? Well, they're all coded to expire in 30 days. So should I wait 30 days, then switch to blue, right? So you're going to have more technical complexity when you need to have more in sync, real time, uh, and quick, uh, revoking and banning of those key cards when you need to. And that's not to say it's not doable. It just means that you're going to have to do a little bit of extra research and work. And there are approaches to fix that kind of stuff. But I find that starting out with stateless authentication workflows is an easier thing to understand because it can be changed to work as stateful authentication with simply taking whatever tokens or cards we make with the stateless system and then simply storing them in the database and boom, if we store them in the database and look them up in the database every time, we essentially switch from stateless to stateful in the blink of an eye, which is why I like teaching it this way. And you know, after years of teaching different kinds of authentication workflows and ideas, I've kind of honed it down to this way of being one of the easier ways to, to get up and running with on your projects and also makes it easy to learn the other one Whereas I think going from state full to fully state less can be kind of trippy sometimes. So that's it for this particular video. And the next one, we're going to talk about some more theory, unfortunately, before we get coding. But I wanted to get in y'all's heads some basic terms and concepts of what we're going to be doing, as well as that hotel analogy. Because again, I really enjoyed when I learned that one myself to try and make sense of what the heck we're trying to do here. See y'all in the next video.